Welcome everyone. I want to welcome you to the Amplify Her District Attorney Candidate Forum. My name is Etta Santiago and I am Manhattan Borough Director for Amplify Her and I'm also one of your moderators this evening. The election of a district attorney is a once in a generation event because they don't typically have term limits. While the current Manhattan DA has been in office for 11 years, his predecessor was there for 34 which means that whoever wins this June and later on in November in the general will probably be there for decades. If you are arrested in New York City, the district attorney can make all the difference. They decide whether or not you'll be charged, whether you will have to pay bail in order to fight your cause from home or in, from a jail cell, and largely determine whether you will be forced to serve time behind bars. District attorneys also conduct investigations and are able to grant immunity. When someone in Manhattan is accused of or found guilty of committing a crime, the new DA can decide if low income and people of color are treated the same as the wealthy and the well-connected. If survivors of sexual assault and harassment are believed and are treated with dignity. And if people who cause harm are held accountable. Although the office has been in existence for 220 years, the Manhattan DA seat has never been held by a woman. After years of scandal, as wealthy individuals engage in fraudulent activity with near impunity, and powerful men were able to sexually abuse and torment women for years without facing consequences, we are now looking forward to hearing from the women running about how they plan to improve the Manhattan DA's office and work to create a more just criminal justice system for everyone. With that, I'd like to welcome the six women running for Manhattan DA, Tahani Abushi, Liz Crody, Tali Farhadian Weinstein, Diana Florence, Lucy Lang, and Elisa Orleans. Welcome. At this point, we invite each candidate to make a 60 second opening statement Candidates, please speak to your experience and how you are prepared to lead the Manhattan DA office with a full-time staff of more than 1,500 employees and an annual budget of $126 million. Lucy Lang, we'll begin with you. Thank you, Etta, and thank you so much to the amazing women of Amplify Her for bringing us all together tonight. Since I was in law school, I have been committed to the unique issues facing women in our criminal justice system. That included being editor in chief of the Journal of Gender and Law and representing women incarcerated at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility in family court proceedings. As an assistant district attorney here in Manhattan, I worked on some of the most violent domestic violence cases in the city. And I worked closely with the mothers and sisters of victims of terrible street violence, including homicides. I ran a college and prison course that brings assistant district attorneys inside New York State's prisons. And I've taught that class in a women's facility, Edgecombe Correctional, and seen the unique challenges facing women inside. And as a national criminal justice reform leader, I have worked to, alongside survivors to develop protocols for integrating trauma and survivor-centered practices into the district attorney's office. I'm thrilled to have the support of some heroic women in my candidacy, including survivors of sexual violence by Harvey Weinstein and the mothers of young men who've lost their lives to police violence, including Sean Bell's mother. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you for convening us. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, we're gonna hear now from Eliza Orleans. Hi, I'm Eliza Orleans. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. As the only public defender in the race, I know that it's incredibly important to have robust conversations about the way in which the criminal legal system is not only rigged in favor of the wealthy, powerful, and white, but also the extent to which the system mistreats and dehumanizes women, gender non-conforming, non-binary, and trans people, especially when they're black or brown. In my nearly dozen years as a public defender, I have countless stories about the human beings I've worked for who've been marginalized by the system. I've had clients who couldn't 
access reproductive health care while incarcerated and who've been left to bleed through their pants in the courtroom. I've seen the persistent mistreatment of and violence towards Black trans sex workers who are regularly dehumanized and targeted by the NYPD, the DA's office, and the prison system. And I've been part of enough court cases to know that in order to create real systemic change, the next Manhattan DA must have two things, an authentic commitment to making change and a sense of urgency when it comes to following through on that promise. I will fight every day to dismantle the criminal punishment bureaucracy that destroys the lives of so many women, their families, and their communities in Manhattan, and I'm looking forward to speaking more about my experience and plans to reform with all of you tonight. Now we'll hear from Tahani Abushi. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tahani Abushi, and I'm a civil rights attorney running to transform this office away from a place that protects the powerful and privilege and one that focuses justice on people. Um, in my time as a civil rights attorney, as a Muslim woman, I have seen and fought against the system that has enabled the powerful and privileged to take advantage of women, that has allowed our NYPD and other agencies to take advantage of our trans women by refusing to decriminalize sex work, but instead using it as an opportunity to not only take advantage, but use them to fill quotas and abuse their powers. You see, we all operate in a profession that is majority done by men. And so as women, we are not only making historic plays by running for Manhattan District Attorney, we're going to ensure that we are putting no badge or bank account above the law and ensuring that we have equal treatment um, inside and outside of the courtroom. And so I'm excited to share more of my vision for the Manhattan District Attorney's Office with you and talk more about how we're going to center the voices of the impacted communities in our plan moving forward. Thank you here tonight. I'm born and raised here in New York City. I, I witnessed my first crime as a six-year-old young girl when a grocery store was robbed at gunpoint. I have two nieces who grew up here in New York as well. They didn't grow up in the same New York I did in the 70s and 80s. And I think that's the New York we have to strive for. Public safety is a real threat right now in New York in a post-corona world. We had a woman and a, a child punched on the subway the other day. We need to start having real conversations about how we keep the city safe and how we make it safer. I have a unique perspective in this race as I was a Manhattan DA for six years, but I've spent the past 13 years representing individuals. I have the breadth of experience to lead this office where everyone feels listened to, where you listen to every victim, you hear what you have they have to say, and you lead an office where the job is to do the right thing and value everybody who comes into that building. It's my breadth of experience that makes me different from everyone, and I look forward to having the conversation tonight. Thanks. Good evening. I'm Tali Farhidi and Weinstein. 40 years ago, my family arrived at JFK Airport on Christmas Eve with just a few suitcases. My parents had wanted to live in fairness and safety so badly that they were willing to pack their bags and move across an ocean for it to a place where my father did not speak one word of the language. And then we struggled for over a decade in a legal system that felt inexplicable, mysterious, and with power over us in order to become American citizens. And that only ended when there was an amnesty in the late 80s. These are the experiences that have shaped my life. I have never taken fairness and safety for granted, and I have dedicated myself to fighting for fairness and safety in my work across American legal institutions and for three attorneys general of the United States, from the Supreme Court to the front office of the Justice Department where I worked for Eric Holder, to federal prosecution with Loretta Lynch, and to the Brooklyn DA's office, where as part of the leadership and management team, I helped to enact historic criminal justice reform. And in Manhattan, I want to pull back from the cases that perpetuate gender, racial, and socioeconomic injustice, and instead to put our resources into the things that matter, like gender-based violence. Thank you. My name is Diana Florence, and I'm running for DA to fight for the people who never thought they'd win. It's what I did for more than two decades as a, the leader of the first of its kind construction fraud task force. This was not the regular same old thing. This was a community based model of prosecution that targeted crimes of power, not crimes of poverty. My career has been, spy, been spent fighting for corp, against corporations that steal and kill workers, people like 
Carlos Moncayo, who was 22 years old when he died in an unprotected 14 foot trench in the middle of a multi million dollar construction site. I have prosecuted people that abuse their domestic partners and committed sexual assault. And I've targeted big real estate that rip off tenants and harass them out of their homes. That's exactly what your DA is supposed to do. But the current DA has done the opposite, over-criminalizing people of color and holding survivors to an impossible perfect victim standard while giving a pass to people like Weinstein, Epstein, and Trump. I understand that we need to change that calculus and we need to go after corruption because it not only ensures real consequences both for those who cheat, but ensures that everyone has access to desperately needed funds to fix our schools, housing, and healthcare. I have the support of 15 labor unions and I, I am so glad to be here representing everyday New Yorkers and I'm excited to be part of the conversation. Thank you so much. One's experience in the justice system is too often dictated by race, gender, income, immigration status, or housing status. As district attorney, how we you ensure there aren't disparities in investigating, prosecuting, and sentencing? And how will you work to protect Manhattan's most marginalized communities? Thank you for the question and for bringing our focus to the intolerable disparities that we do see throughout the criminal justice system when it comes to how we treat both the people who are accused and importantly, the victims of crime. And this is something that we thought about every single day. How can we get a handle on these disparities, reckon with them, be transparent in accounting for them, and then change our policies in response to them? And I think that the answer does come from being honest about what has come before. That's why I took care in the Brooklyn DA's office to reckon with the first 25 exonerations and publish a landmark report about the cases that we got wrong as an institution. And then it means making sure that we do open up to better reporting. And one of the things that I'm most proud of is that we sued ICE, the Trump administration, and we won over their policy of arresting people in and around our courthouses, because we found that there was a noticeable impact on women who were not citizens, who had stopped reporting domestic violence incidents against them because they were afraid. We took that to federal court. We stood up for those immigrant women. And I'm proud to say that we got ICE out of our courthouses and out of our way. You know, uh, uh, this is such an important question and I appreciate it so much. I spent my career protecting, um, working not for, but alongside women and immigrants in particular. And it starts with my work as uh, in domestic violence. And I, I think it's often easier to explain my policies with the actual experience I've had. You know, many years ago uh, when I was first starting out, I picked up a case um, that came before me uh, involving a husband who attacked his wife with the backside of a hammer. And she they were black and they lived in NYCHA. And the case came in as a low level felony assault. And that made no sense to me. It was an absurd undercharging. And it is the way racism and how women and survivors have really been historically marginalized in our system. I'm proud to tell you that immediately I saw the absurdity and I charged it the way it should have been which was attempted murder, but it was more than just me. It wasn't, the story really isn't about me. What it was, was about working together with that woman and her two little girls who were witnesses uh, to the assault and the attempted murder. And every week, working alongside them, seeing them day in, day out, and, and really putting in the time, getting to know each other, and making sure that at the end of the our time together, when it was time to go to trial, that she was invested, she was ready, and we got the right result. And all these years later, nearly 22, we are still in touch. And I can tell you that that that, that it, sorry, my, I just see my time is up, apologies. But that, that case is, is, is endemic of the way I would approach this type of work. As a public defender for over a decade, I've represented over 3,000 people charged with crimes, and the vast majority of whom were people of color. And that wasn't an accident, that wasn't an aberration. It's because our criminal legal system is working exactly as designed, exactly as a rigged system is supposed to. It is a profoundly racist system. 
as we know, people of color are more likely to be arrested. They're more likely to be charged. They're more likely to be held pre-trial. They're more likely to face felony charges. They're more likely to have money bail set on their cases. And they're more likely to have higher bail amounts set. This results in forced plea deals, longer prison sentences, the loss of one's job, one's home, one's children. And this all perpetuates the racist nature of the system. And so the only way to break this status quo is through transformative change. Um, and that's what I want to do as district attorney. I want to end cash bail, decriminalize drug possession, decriminalize sex work, decriminalize crimes of poverty and be transparent with all of the data with the cases not charged. Furthermore, I wanna actually have an immigration unit as opposed to what the district attorney's office does now because it falls entirely on public defenders and, and defense attorneys who have to figure out whether there are going to be immigration consequences when our clients are charged with crimes or, or wanna to plea to a lesser offense. And so employing a fully staffed, staffed immigration unit will make sure that we can stand up for people and take into account their, their circumstances when we are bringing cases, um, but really uh, declining to prosecute so many of those cases to begin with. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tahani Abushi. You know, I am the child of immigrants from Palestine and, and we were born and raised uh, in a heavy, diverse immigrant neighborhood. And when I was 14, my father was sentenced to 22 years in prison and they had charged my mother to force my father to take a plea. Um, and so um, the disproportionate impact of this system on communities of color, on our immigrant communities is deliberate. Uh, people of color have been made to be the face of crime in this city, and we are scapegoated for the powerful and privileged to do whatever they want with impunity. That's why I became an attorney, and I've spent my career fighting to balance the scales of justice. I've held officers accountable, have come into our neighborhoods, Harlem, Washington Heights, Inwood, and the Lower East Side, to fill their quotas. I've defended victims of sexual assaults and harassments who were dismissed, questioned, and demeaned. Uh, by police and prosecutors alike. And we have fought to have our voices heard and justice served. Um, my plan for the district attorney's office is as a civil rights attorney, I know where the loopholes are. So I've started with replacing the early case assessment bureau with an arrest review unit, where we're going to focus on shrinking the footprint of this office by analyzing officer information, allegations, conduct, how evidence was received, who are the people being stopped? What is the history of the officer? Because that is the introduction civilians have to the prosecution system by way through law enforcement. So it's extremely important that we have transparency and accountability starting with that unit. I've seen as a defense attorney and as a, a domestic violence prosecutor, what I think people don't inherently understand was one of the biggest discrepancies of victims is what happens. When a defendant gets arrested, they go and they get they get explained to what's happening to them by the police, then they get a defense attorney, and then they, they are told at least what the process is and what happens, but that's not the same for victims. They don't, they don't have uh, any outreach. Sometimes if a district attorney can't get in touch with them and, or the police can't get in touch with them, they have no idea what's happening. They don't, and I think we need to have a system that listens to victims, informs them, about what's going on, here's what's happening in, in those places and, and how these things are happening and really is responsive to those things. And I think that that's why, you know, in, in one of the things to lead the office is to lead a domestic violence sex crimes bureau, which prioritizes victims and listens to them and hears them. And also is an, an ability to, to approach these things and get to victims and say, here's what's going on and here's what's happening in your case. And these ADAs would only work on these types of cases. And I think that that's where we start is we start listening to victims, prioritizing them and really being able to be a resource for victims so that they can move on. And I think that's the office that I would like. And now we'll hear from Lucy Lang. One of the closest advisors to my campaign was born in prison while her mother was shackled and chained to a bed in the medical ward. She was immediately taken from her mother without being able to nurse and put into the foster care system. It should be no wonder to anyone that she ended up in prison herself by the time she was 17 years old. Addressing your question, Etta, means recognizing that this is structural and generational. And I've committed to a racial justice plan that's laid out on my website, votelucylang.com, that starts with a reckoning of this history 
And it lays out the necessity to decline to prosecute crimes of poverty, to divert cases out of the system that don't belong in it, to build out alternatives to incarceration. So they're not alternatives, so they are the default. And that takes as a stated objective of the district attorney's office, ending and dismantling mass incarceration. I'm also committed to building a survivor-centered office that includes in the Domestic Violence Bureau, in the Sex Crimes Bureau, and a comprehensive approach to addressing crimes related to the LGBTQ plus communities, which have for far too long been underserved and marginalized by law enforcement. Thank you. Um, hello everyone, my name is Samantha Lee and I am a borough director with Amplify Her. I will be asking the next question. How would each of you balance protecting the public with avoiding the harms of over-policing and will you commit resources to non-police based public safety measures. Eliza Orleans, we'll begin with you. So I think that that's such an important question. Thank you, Sam. Um, and, and as I've talked about as a public defender, I've seen the way in which you know we talk about justice, we talk about safety. And as Americans, we've really been sold this false choice between public safety and incarceration. And locking people up is not what keeps us safe. The status quo is not working and it never will. And so of course I will and have committed to investing in resources. I mean, investing resources into community-based programs, into things that will actually keep us safe, you know, into violence interrupters, into things where people who are within the community can be in charge of their own determination, as opposed to a paternalistic prosecutor coming in and saying, I know what's best for you. We're going to mandate services and then actually hold incarceration over your head. So if you have some sort of issue, we're going to then just put you in jail or prison. And that can't be the way in which we operate. We should be centering people. We should be addressing the underlying issues people are facing. And we should be thinking about bringing about real change, um, not just you know, the same as that we've always seen. And so I think that that's something that, that really demonstrates the commitment to changing the system. Um, you know, Cy Vance ran on progressive promises that obviously he hasn't kept. So we need to make sure that the person who we elect to be the next Manhattan district attorney is deeply committed to making these changes from day one. Thank you. Um, we'll now hear from Tahani Abushi. Yeah, so I think this is a, a, a crucial question. Um, as a civil rights attorney, I have held officers accountable, whether it's discipline, termination, or having them criminally charged for their misconduct. Um, and I've changed policy within the NYPD. So I'm the only one here that has sued the NYPD, then sat across the table from the commissioner and rewrote policy. And my commitment is to ensure we put no badge or bank account above the law and we don't give special treatment to law enforcement. Um, it's too dangerous. There's a, a grave imbalance of power and it allows for the railroading and destabilizations of our families. It's important that the NYPD is put back in their place as public servants. And although we work with them, we all are in service of the public. And so the way to do that is we can accomplish public safety by investing resources in our families. You know, when I was 14 and my father started his prison sentence, um, we were susceptible to a lot of vulnerabilities and bad influences, and they were at our fingertips. But resources, after school programs, mental health counselings, uh, things that would help make our families make ends meet were very difficult to come by. And so it's important that we see these instabilities as they exist, we respond with resources. And instead of pumping police mon uh, money to police through these community policing programs, we instead partner directly with community-based organizations to help us address root causes of crimes, focus on rehabilitation and preventing recidivism. Thank you. Liz Crotty. I'm, there's over-policing, there's also under-policing. And I think that you need to really have a system where it's policing works you know, respectfully, thoughtfully, and, and accurately. Uh, and I also think you know, the district attorney's office does not have a say in where the NYPD spends its money. That's up to the NYPD. I think the district attorney's office should reinvest in communities and, and has been doing so for, for quite some time. And we should maintain that and if not do more. But at the same time, you have to look at these things and say, okay, what are we doing? This is not going to rise and fall with just the district attorney's office. This is a going to have to be a concerted effort where it is 
the district attorney's office, the NYPD, the, you know, and the precinct councils and community leaders, and that they all get together and they all have an open dialogue where community leaders can say, here's what's going on in my community. Here are the crimes that I see being committed. And here are the things that we need to look at as an NYPD and as the district attorney's office. And, he, and I think that that's what we need to work on is, is getting all sides to the table to have, have it so everyone feels safe in every neighborhood because that's what, that's what the job is, is to provide public safety for all people across the bureau, bu the, bu eh, the borough, thanks. Thank you. We'll now hear from Diana Florence. You know, there's no question that, you know, people that look like me, when we see a police car, we feel safe, but, but people of color do not. And that is a fundamental failing of our law enforcement system. And it stems from the fact that for too long, there have been police officers who have felt that they are above the law and therefore they have been, they have gotten away with crime. We need to reset. We need to make sure that whoever you are, whether you're a police officer, whether you're the president of the United States, whether you are a powerful movie executive, that we are all subject to the same laws. And that when we break those laws, we are held accountable in a transparent way. So that means holding police accountable. And everyone in this race, frankly, has a police accountability program and everyone has similar ideas. There's not there, the devil of course is in the details. My my approach stems directly from my experience. It's about proactively looking for the bad actors and being transparent about the work that we do to make sure that if they commit crimes they will be held accountable. We also need to be going out into communities and not going out when it's trendy or when it's comfortable. But being part of the community means being out there all the time, hearing directly at community boards, at community education councils, and being a direct conduit to the very people that have been harmed. Until the district attorney does that and is consistently in the community, uh, we are gonna be repeating the same problem whether or not we have an accountability program or not. Thank you. And finally, Tali Fahardi and Weinstein. Samantha, I'm so glad that you asked about balance because there are so many things that are out of balance or really out of whack uh, when it comes to law enforcement in this space. First of all, you know, it was Eric Holder who told me probably 15 years ago uh, that the same communities that are over-policed are often underprotected, and particularly in communities of color. We have to recalibrate that balance and make sure people are getting the police responses that they need. Second, talk about out of, out of balance. The NYPD only spends 1% of its resources on the detectives who investigate both sexual assault and crimes against children. That is radically out of balance with where our priorities should be and will be in the influence that I can have on the NYPD. And finally, I think that the way that we have balanced the various needs of survivors needs to change. And I'm gonna talk more tonight about the Bureau of Gender-Based Violence that I want to build. And one of its features is going to be making sure that prosecution sits alongside all of the other actors who provide services to survivors, whether it's immigration services or housing support or all manner of counseling, mental health treatment, all of the things that a person who has suffered this kind of harm really needs in order to move past it. I don't mean to be glib about this, but I suspect that many of us would agree that in some ways women are the best suited to address precisely these problems. I think about a letter that the district attorney's office received many years ago from concerned anonymous tenants of a large housing complex, and it was from the moms. And the moms were saying, Someone got shot and killed in our playground. Our children can't go outside. There are narcotics traffickers bringing hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of poison through our neighborhood. And, and we are, have to keep our children cloistered inside as a result. And it was alongside the moms that I worked to build an investigation and ultimately to work to refurbish that community at the conclusion of the investigation. These traffickers were using children as young as eight years old in furtherance of their conspiracies. And as a result of working alongside those mothers, 
members, I've committed to a community engagement strategy that includes advisory councils comprised of LGBTQ plus community members, directly impacted community members, and that really seeks to integrate the community into the district attorney's office. I'm also committed to ending the prohibition on assistant district attorneys serving on community boards and community associations, to engaging with faith-based communities that are so much more often likely to understand what's happening at the ground level, and to integrating into the performance metrics of assistant district attorneys a community work metric so that they are rewarded and incentivized to be out in the communities, not just doing prosecution, but doing the hard work of engaging at the community level, because that's what is really going to build trust between the district attorney's office and the communities we serve. Thank you. I will now move to our next question. You will each have a minute to answer this question. As DA, and some of you began to anticipate it. So as DA, how would you address the use of force issue and hold officers accountable for police brutality and corruption? And on a related note, do you support the defund the police movement and would you support slashing the Manhattan DA budget? Tahani Abushi, we'll begin with you. The police accountability is monumental in the communities I come from, the communities that raise me, the communities that have I have stood by um, for so long. Uh, this is the introduction to the prosecution system. Uh, and it's an opportunity where the NYPD comes into our neighborhoods um, and still continues stop and frisk and um, false arrests, false imprisonments, followed by malicious prosecution. Um, <clears throat> and we know that the word of an officer is golden compared to the word of a civilian. And that's why I focus part of my career on law office, uh, law enforcement accountability. And so my commitment is to put no badge above the law and to hold them accountable, just like I have been doing as a civil rights attorney and ensure that that process is transparent, which means in the early case assessment bureau that we soon replace, we're going to ensure that all of the data collected about the underlying arrest, the allegations and the history of the officer is made public. And we will use our office as a bully pulpit to stand with advocates to push reform and change. Um, I certainly support um, decreasing the budget of the DA's office and the NYPD as well. Thank you. Diana Florence. Yes, there's no question that, you know, there's too much money that has been spent on police while they have not had uh, the, you know, they've, they've been spending all this time on poverty, addiction, and mental health. And we need to be using that money uh, to go to the very experts who can handle those types of issues, such as social service agencies. So we certainly need to be doing that. There's no question. But when it comes to police accountability, which I alluded to in my last, um, my last answer, we need to be really being clear that no one is above the law. And, and the way we do that is we actually proactively look for the cases and we do that, we go where the information is. That means the CCRB and that means within communities. That way we can weed out who those, those bad actors are and hold accountable those police officers. And if we cannot do that for whether it's a legal loophole or whether it shouldn't, it doesn't rise to a level of a crime. We need to be transparent about that. We also need to use 50A because that has finally been this declassified. We can use that to look for the criminality that has frankly been uh, that's lived. Thank you. Thank you, Liz Crotty. Yeah, I, I don't support defunding the police. I think that we need to train them better and pay them more. I think that the district attorney's office, yeah, could. Oh, I think uh, after coronavirus and the ten billion dollar budget gap in New York City is facing and the state is facing, I think that every agency across the state and the city is going to have no choice but to look at uh, decreasing budgets. But you know, the legislature passed discovery reform, so we have. Um, requirements now as district attorneys to hand over uh, evidence much sooner, much faster, and that takes manpower. So I think we have to look at all of these things. And as for police accountability, you have to hold everyone to the same standard. And if a police officer breaks the law, you have to hold them to the same standard. But you also have to understand too, police have a hard job. And it's that balance of policing and what's going on that you have to look at and the facts and circumstance of every case is what matters. Thank you. Tali Farhadi and Weinstein. Samantha, thank you. 
Nobody is above the law. And in Brooklyn, I built the Law Enforcement Accountability Bureau and I supervised it. And we made a point of bringing cases, not just around force, but also lying under oath, tampering with evidence, the kinds of crimes that are always wrong. And when police officers commit them, have the effect of degrading trust in the system. I also think another piece of accountability is making sure we know who our police officers are. I've written, for example, about the fact that domestic violence is two to four times more likely to occur in police families than in civilian families. We need to know that. And if you listen to my podcast, the episode with Barry Sheck, it's called Hearing. We talk about how we might use big data to make sure that that information is available to us so that we know who is policing us. I don't support defunding the police because what I want to see is the police spending money on the right things. That 1% statistic that I gave, that should just stop all of us in our tracks. Obviously, that is not the right commitment of resources. Conversely, when police respond to domestic violence incidents, I want to make sure that it's people who are trained to be able to meet the needs of the survivors who are making those calls. And I don't support defunding the DA's office because some of the things that I want to do, like build a transformational Bureau of Gender-Based Violence or build a conviction review unit and a post-conviction justice bureau, as I did in Brooklyn, require a real commitment of resources and they deserve them. Thank you. Lucy Lang. Just this past weekend, I was proud to stand alongside the family of Christian Hall, who just last month was in the middle of a mental health crisis and standing on a bridge about to jump when the police were called in Monroe, Pennsylvania. And they responded with guns out. He turned with his hands up and was shot seven times and killed. This is an example of the egregious failures of law enforcement in this country to respond to mental health crises, which we know are only going to increase in the wake of the, pa the pandemic. And they reflect the need for us to drastically change policing in this country, including investing in and expanding community-based initiatives within the police department, advocating for the decriminalization of poverty so that there's simply less contact between police and communities. The district attorney's office needs to be proactive in police department training and policy and closely monitor high risk situations where we know that there is potential for police violence like protests. We also need to take a public health approach to so many categories of crime, including mental health and substance misuse. We need to expand the office's tracking of police credibility and need to make sure to, to provide reports and transparency so the public understands that the district attorney is committed to police accountability and protects the public, not the police. Thank you, Eliza Orlands. Yes, so to answer the original question, um, I absolutely support a 50% reduction in the district attorney's budget as well as in the NYPD. Um, you know, I think that if our criminal legal system is going to continue to have a prosecutor's office, then it's imperative to identify concrete ways of limiting the reach of the prosecutor's power. Even prosecutors who've been held out as progressive prosecutors oftentimes have not kept campaign promises and have been and remain the primary driver of mass incarceration of people of color. So it is absolutely imperative that we commit to reducing the budget and investing in our communities. Now, as a public defender, I saw time and time again with stunning regularity, perjury in the courthouse, falsifying documents, false arrests, and then of course the physical violence perpetrated by the police in the streets. And even when I raised these things the DA's office, you know, these examples of chronic misconduct, nothing was done. There was no accountability. So I'm committed to creating a robust police accountability unit staffed by public defenders who have the most experience of anyone cross-examining police officers who build the cases that are later used to sue the police. And the Manhattan DA's office has been complicit in this continuing misconduct. So as district attorney, I will restore trust and integrity to that office. I would have been both a, I'm the only person in this race who's been both a prosecutor and a defense attorney. So I was a, uh, under Mr. Morgan though, I was there for six years and I've, I started my own law practice 13 years ago doing all criminal defense work. What I've learned in the past 21 years, and especially as a de defense attorney, is that you have to listen and you really have to listen what is going on and hear all the facts. But also to the practice that I have seen in the past 12 years has gotten lazy. And I would start leading an office that cleans up 
the practice of how the district attorney's office is practicing law. Certificates of readiness are constantly used to prolong cases unnecessarily. There's no reason why a misdemeanor cannot be tried in six months. Orders of protection are just issued blanketly without any investigation whatsoever of how it affects a defendant's or victims, home, school, you know, any, anything. And I think that we need to look at these things and say, okay, we need to do better. They need to, the practice needs to be better. You need to clean up the practice. But I think on top of that, you have to lead an office where the job is to do the right thing. And that means to investigate your cases fully, get to the bottom of the facts and to do what is right according to those facts. So I think that is what the office has to lead first and foremost. It is not about convicting people. It is about doing what is right. And that is what I have learned in the past 21 years. And I have seen firsthand in the past 13 that that has not been happening. And that's what I bring to this race. And that is a unique experience and perspective that nobody else has. I feel lucky that I already got to address part of this question, which is reducing the footprint of the DA's office and putting additional funding into our communities and not our additional law enforcement. Um, and so as a public defender, I've seen the way in which prosecutions of low level offenses have destroyed lives, have destroyed families. You know, I talk a lot about a client of mine who was an assistant manager to Gristides in lower Manhattan, and he'd worked at the same Gristides for 25 years, made his way up to assistant manager. And one night after locking up the store and buying two bags of groceries with his employee discount, he walked over to the A train to head uptown and got on an uncrowded subway car, put his groceries on the seats next to him and prepared for his ride home. And at the 125th Street stop, two uniformed NYPD officers got on the train, grabbed his groceries, dumped them to the ground, placed him in handcuffs, and took him to jail for the night for the crime of occupying multiple seats on a transit facility. That case was brought to ECAB, and the Manhattan District Attorney's Office wrote up the case. They didn't decline to prosecute it. They prosecuted a man for taking up two seats on the subway. Now, I, I this is exactly why my experience has, has really fostered in me this this absolute you know disdain for for the way in which cases get prosecuted and that is because the overwhelming majority of misdemeanors should not be prosecuted and I will not prosecute them you know these are cases where we're prosecuting people because they're experiencing poverty or homelessness or mental health issues or substance use disorder. And, and we're using resources that could be going back into communities to instead destroy lives. It costs $975 a night to put someone on Rikers Island. Imagine what that money could be spent for if we think about investing in people. Thank you. Thank you, Eliza. Um, Diana Florence. Thank you. You know, the first case I ever wrote up more than 25 years ago involved a, a nurse who was coming home from work and she was the victim of a subway grinder. And when I wrote it up, the, 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 the male assistant who was supervising me told me that I made a grave error and I wondered if it was legal. But what my error was with us, I picked up the phone when I saw what happened to her and I spoke to her directly as soon as the case came in. And I realized very early on that my approach, which has always been about focusing on the survivor and what her individual needs are, uh, was different. But it is something that I've stayed with me my entire 25 year career. And I have understood that unfortunately that DA's office has not changed in 45 years. Robert Morgenthau was revolutionary when he came in in 1975, but now under Cy Vance, it has perpetuated this fo overly focused um, situation of crimes of poverty while leaving cases like crimes of power that I prosecuted like wage theft, landlord tenant fraud, domestic violence, sexual assault, really defunded of resources. So it's very important using the experience that I had to inform the vision that we refocus that office. We put the bulk of the attorneys and the resources into the very crimes that destroy people's lives. I understand that because I've done this work already. And more than anyone in this race, I understand it hands on because I lived this for 25 years. That is the type of, of approach we need to take. And it is what I will do as DA. Etta, 
Last week, Merrick Garland laid out in his confirmation hearings, you know, he gave me my first job out of law school. He remains a close mentor to me. He laid out what I think it means to be a just prosecutor and to do reform. He said, we've got to stop using our resources to bring the cases that are not making anybody's life better, often worse. He cited misdemeanor marijuana possession cases. And then he said, and I think this is crucial, we have to put our resources into bringing the cases that really matter. And he cited for him, violence and white supremacy. And my list starts with gun violence, shootings have doubled in the last year, and then it goes to Bureau of Gender-Based Violence, because that's also reform, is making sure that we are doing more in the places where we have not done enough. And in terms of experience, I spent, the, I'm the only candidate in this race who spent two years in the leadership and in the management of a local prosecutor's office just across the river, a little bit bigger than the Manhattan DA's office, bringing to life exactly what I just said, less of some things, more of others. We dismantled parts of the office. We built entirely new bureaus in order to make this vision a reality. And I bring that experience of not just wanting to do it, but knowing how to do it to the Manhattan DA's office. Thank you, Tally. And, and now we'll hear from Lucy Lang. As a national criminal justice reform leader and a former assistant district attorney here in Manhattan, I know that the role of the district attorney encompasses far more than prosecution, but the next district attorney has to take a 360 degree view of the system and everyone it touches. Let me give you an example. When I was a homicide prosecutor some years ago, I got a call in the middle of the night to respond to a crime scene. And what had happened tragically was that uh, two masked gunmen emerged from behind a parked car and opened fire on a crowded street, hitting five people and killing one who was the father of a three-year-old. Over the course of more than a year of investigation, I became close to the mother of the young man who'd been killed, who is now raising her grandson, supporting her daughter, working multiple jobs. And ultimately, the case went to trial. I tried it, a jury returned a guilty verdict, and I called the mother of the man who'd been killed the morning after the crime, the conviction, and asked her how she felt, and she said, I slept all night for the first time since my son was killed, but when I woke up, all I could think about were the moms of those two boys, referring to the two men who'd just been convicted of killing her son. Her largesse of spirit and the fact that I was a new parent myself at the time inspired me to create a first of its kind college and prison course to bring assistant district attorneys inside New York State's prisons to develop ideas for reform together and to implement them. And it's that kind of co-creation model that I intend to bring to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, which I know inside and out from working to reform the system from inside and from outside it as a national criminal justice reform leader. Thank you, Lucy. And we're going to uh, wrap up this question with Tahani Abushi. You know, there was a moment in my parents' trial where the judge had interrupted the proceedings and he asked the prosecutor, what are you going to do with all these kids? Pointing to my nine siblings and I in his courtroom. And without hesitating, she said, they're not my problem. And she kept it moving as business, like it was business as usual. Um, and that is the moment I realized that these offices, this system don't see us as human beings. Um, they are in the business of destabilizing and throwing families away. That's one of the things that inspired me to become an attorney. And as a civil rights lawyer, I've spent the last decade in people's living rooms across the city, hearing some of the most intimate, disturbing, and frustrating details that they could never even share with their siblings, spouses, or loved ones. And I've held the hand in hand and made structural changes. Now, as a district attorney, we are supposed to be instilling policy. We are going to lead transformational change. And that means identifying the loopholes and making sure that we actually change them. That's what I've done, whether it was with the NYPD, the fire department or the Department of Education. I get in there, I identify abusive policies and practices and I change them. And so as Manhattan district attorney, that's why my decline and prosecute list that is why my arrest review unit, my police accountability policy, all stems in these structural changes, identifying how officers use things like disorderly conduct to cover for bad policing and make for easy prosecutions and then take them out of either hand. Um, it's things like data transparency, ensuring that we understand how things are operating, things that I get during the discovery time, but usually after it's too late. All of this information is going to be made available upfront in the beginning so that people have a fair fight and that we are actually making these structural changes. Thank you. Um, 
I will now turn to the next question, Diana Florence, you're going to be the first respondent. Um, as district attorney, are there offenses you will decline to prosecute? And if so, what are these? And please share why you think alternatives to incarceration are better. Thank you so much. You know, marijuana legalization is coming, but very at this very moment, people every day, particularly people of color, are still being arrested for marijuana crimes. So we need to immediately full stop, stop enforcing the marijuana rules, which frankly have basis in racism. So we need to start with that. We also, I also pledge that I will not prosecute uh, crimes related to police escalation. This summer, we had a great example of that. A person on the subway was asked to move by a police officer, and when he didn't, he was assaulted and then charged with obstruct obstruction. That is wrong, and we must stop that. So we need, other than that, what we need to be doing is refocusing our efforts, as I said before, on crimes of power. And when it comes to crimes of poverty, things that come out of people's circumstances, we need to be addressing those issues with common sense solutions. So someone who, uh, who uses heroin on my corner. You know, the old way of doing this is sending him to jail for three days. And then when he gets out of Rikers Island, it, it ends up, it goes to your corner. And that doesn't help, it doesn't help him and it doesn't help the community. We can spend the same amount of money, and I understand it to be $460 an evening at Rikers, which by the way, is more than what Ted Cruz paid at the Ritz Carlton. We can actually use the money that we're spending at Rikers to do common sense solutions and diversify those very people from those crimes of poverty. Thank you. Hani Abushi. Yeah, when we talk about shrinking the footprint of this office, um, that sounds great, but the how part is where it's important. And that's why the decline of prosecute list is so important. You know, as a civil rights attorney, and I started out as a criminal defense attorney, um, I see how certain charges are used to cover for bad policing. So one of the things that are on my list are things like disorderly conduct, um, because these are again, used to allow for police to go as far as they wanna go, as long as you have this charge, um, it, it allows or cuts you out of, of any kind of accountability. Crimes of poverty, substance use disorder, homelessness, mental illness, all of those things are will be declined to prosecute um, under my administration. Not only do they not impact public safety, but they exacerbate the underlying issues that we never actually get to. Um, the other things are on my list, things like sex work, right? We need to fully decriminalize sex work, not the Nordic model, but go all the way and ensure that um, consensual engagements between adults uh, are allowed to happen. And anyone that do want to, does want to seek help can have that avenue without fear of any repercussion or revenge. We need to protect the treatment and progress um, that people are making to get better and we can't criminalize them. And so to say that we're gonna first charge and then give you help, this help comes within the confines of punitive measures where every time you slip up, you relapse, you make a mistake, you get something wrong, you now have more penalties over your head. These things simply don't belong in this system. And this is why partnering with community-based organizations that are actually going to address this in a healthy way is the way to go here. And we have a comprehensive list on our site and encourage everyone to go read it. Thank you. Thank you. Lucy Lang. The district attorney should take dismantling mass incarceration as a stated objective. We also have to center the experience of people who survive violent crime and people who are lost to violent crime and grapple with the sad reality that these are increasing during COVID. And in fact, that domestic violence by way of example, which should be of deep concern to everyone here tonight, it is on the rise and is increasingly underreported as a result of be people being uh, stuck in their homes and unable to report. And it is the job of the district attorney's office to ensure that communities of all kinds feel comfortable reporting, are able to report in whatever language they need, have, are able to report either virtually or through community-based options. And that's gonna require partnerships with other agencies, partnerships with schools and educators, bringing clinicians and social workers into the district attorney's office to better serve people who are survivors of crime. We really have to improve the coordination of multiple agencies to ensure that the district attorney's office can fulfill the full mandate, both of ensuring public safety and of shrinking the criminal justice system, which we know has not contributed to public safety in so many ways. 
but it's going to require a collaborative interagency approach, both to decriminalizing things that must be decriminalized and to diverting things into other systems, but ensuring that victims and survivors' voices are heard and prioritized. Thank you. Tali Farhadi and Weinstein. Let's break it down into cases that we should never prosecute or only prosecute under certain circumstances, limited circumstances. So I would put on that side things like marijuana possession, which we've talked about, people involved in prostitution who need services not to be in the criminal justice system, and separate that from cases that come into the system but should be diverted onto off ramps because incarceration is always a last resort. And we want to say there has to be some accountability for this, but what we really want is for people to tackle their underlying problems and not come back into the community and do harm. And so in Brooklyn, we had an array of programs ranging from diversion right at arraignment for folks with chemical dependencies, all the way to a diversion program for young people whose first charge was a gun possession charge. I also think that there's a third category here of cases that need extra supervision because we know that these charges have historically been brought in ways that have disproportionately impacted communities of color or have, or have been unjust in some way. I'm thinking, for example, of a case that we saw in Brooklyn of a young mother who had gone to HRA to fill out a form for her benefits and had gotten into an altercation with the officers there and the PD came because she she was with her baby and she sat where they told her not to sit. And she wound up being arrested for obstructing government administration and resisting arrest. And her baby was torn out of her hands on video. And the district attorney, upon supervising that case, said, you know, we're not going to bring these charges because while it may fit the facts, obviously that is not justice. And that's the kind of review that we have to be doing to make sure we're not using the law to make people's lives worse, not better. Thank you. Thank you, Eliza Orlands. Yes, and I'm I'm so glad that that we're talking about these issues because it's it's so incredibly important. And um, you know, I've already gotten an opportunity to talk about why my work as a public defender really formulated the basis of my decline to prosecute policy, which can be found at my website. And I've talked about those cases, but I do want to specifically focus on on one of those things, um, especially given how it's been uh, talked about in in other people's answers. Um, you know, declining to prosecute sex work fully full decriminalization of consensual sex work is something that's incredibly important. And I'm so glad that so many people have come around to this position. The first time I talked publicly about it was in 2010. And to say it was an unpopular opinion then understates just how resistant people were to talking about it. But but it's so critical that we talk about this because the criminalization of sex work stigmatizes and disproportionately targets people of color and specifically trans women of color who are already some of the most marginalized members of our community. And it traps sex workers in cycles of poverty. It makes them afraid to come forward when they are victims of abuse or other violent acts perpetrated against them. And furthermore, it puts them at risk of police violence against them. So this is the best way we can help people access healthcare, lower the risk of violence. And it is absolutely imperative if we aim to end mass incarceration and advance equality in the LGBTQIA community. Um, you know, just like other prohibition, such as alcohol or drugs, this has been a long running failure. It's made it incredibly difficult for people to, to be legally protected in situations of abuse. And uh, we need to talk about this issue. Thank you, Liz. Crotty? Sure. I mean, I think my, my colleagues on, on this panel aren't really aware of what's going on with bail reform, because currently what's happening on most uh, low-level misdemeanors uh, and, and low-level felonies, people are getting desk appearance tickets. Um, the DA is declining to prosecute from the uh, desk appearance ticket. And if you do have to return to court, it's no longer six weeks, it's two, three months, and uh, it's virtual. So people are, are not coming back to court and the district attorney's office is not prosecuting a lot of low level cases and 
They are not, they haven't prosecuted, I think, a marijuana case in two years, nor have they prosecuted a shoplift case under $100 in, in the same amount of time. And the case gets go, goes directly to divergence. So I think we have to have a conversation about what is actually happening there in the courtroom now as it is, because, you know, I, I think decline to prosecute, um, we're not legislatures, we're DAs, and the job is to enforce the laws of the state of New York. Uh, I, in law school, I had uh, the Supreme Court case about the line item veto and how that was unconstitutional. And I think that's a little bit what DAs are treading the line for. I see as a constituent as a New Yorker, the arguments for not prosecuting certain cases, but that's actually not the job. I think alternatives to incarceration should be looked upon and looked upon when appropriate in every case, because the goal of the next DA is to cut recidivism. But currently right now, people are not coming back to court and a lot of misdemeanors are already not being prosecuted. We each have 90 seconds to answer this next question. Women often do not report the violence they suffer, whether it be assault, rape, trafficking, or domestic abuse. When survivors do report, too often they are not believed or are themselves criminalized for their efforts to survive domestic violence and sexual assault. As DA, what would you do to work towards eradicating sexual violence? Tali Farhadi and Weinstein, we'll begin with you. Thank you for this important question. And you're exactly right, Samantha, across the country, less than half of incidents of domestic violence and sexual assault are even reported to law enforcement. And that should tell us something. People feel like they're not gonna get anything out of coming to us. And that's reflected in the accounts we hear from survivors about being re-traumatized when they do report. And that's why I have said from the beginning that I'm going to build a new Bureau of Gender-Based Violence that's going to be well-resourced probably the most resourced part of the office, and that is going to report directly to me. It's going to house domestic violence, sexual assault, sex crimes, sex trafficking, gender-based hate crimes, gender-based stalking, like cyber stalking. And what we're going to do is make sure that while there's expertise in each of the areas that I've described, there is across the board training in the sensitivities and the expertise that is required of these cases, both for investigators and prosecutors. And I'm going to make sure that we have the commitment and the moral courage that it takes to bring these cases. Now, I want to say, I think part of the problem is that culturally, we are just not there where we should be in understanding not just how dangerous these harms are when they happen, but the fact that you can consent to a relationship, you can consent to a job, you can consent to being somewhere and still not consent to the assault and the violence. And we have to push juries to be able to find accountability and to push past that prejudice. And I, I'm making a pledge that I want to be held accountable if I don't deliver on what I've just said here tonight. Thank you. Lucy Lang? The law has the ability to help change culture. We've seen it with domestic violence and we know that there's still a long way to go, but in our parents' generation, domestic violence cases simply weren't prosecuted. They weren't considered criminal. It was considered a family matter. And that has changed dramatically. We know that we have to drastically expand people's ability to report and comfort reporting, but that does demonstrate what can change. And that's the kind of change that we need to seek to do around sex crimes, because really the fact that a case is hard doesn't mean that the case shouldn't be brought. And I'm proud to stand beside women who have experienced the most violent kinds of sex crimes in building a sex crimes plan for a revamped unit that will invest tremendous resources in creating a survivor-centered approach. It starts with advocating to define consent in the penal law, which it isn't. And that puts the onus on survivors rather than on people who commit harms. I've also committed from the day I launched this campaign to an equal access policy that will end the practice of back door, back room meetings between the district attorney and well-heeled defense lawyers so that there is not even the appearance of impropriety in the handling of cases invol involving high profile people who are charged. I'm committed to survivor centered uh, trainings that are built alongside survivors themselves and to partnering with Safe Horizons and ensuring that the district attorney's office is also investing in kids who are present for instances of gender-based violence who are often forgotten and who can ultimately end up being part of the same vicious cycle themselves. We have to take a holistic view of sex crimes and I'm committed to doing just that. Thank you. Eliza Orlands. 
Yes. So um, from my time as a public defender, I know just how many people I represented who were survivors themselves of physical and sexual violence. Um, and I think that there's no neat categorization of some people are victims and some people are people who perpetrate ha harm on others because I've seen the way in which those two things are, are conflate, I mean, are, are treated as two separate things when in fact, um, that's really, really not what the case is. Um, and, and the real reason why the Domestic Violence Survivor Justice Act, the DVSJA, has come into effect is because of the low um, recidivism rates among those who are domestic violence survivors and the fact that, you know, these um, crimes that often get committed by people who are survivors are in fact the result of the abuse that they were that they were subjected to or, um, you know, other things that they've experienced. And so, you know, the the I've actually been able to utilize that to fight for a client of mine um, under this new law. And the Manhattan District Attorney's Office routinely fights against the use of the DVSJA, which enables downward departures. So one of the commitments I've made in my platform as, you know, for running for Manhattan District Attorney is that I will definitely take that into account and allow for the fact that when survivors defend themselves, our criminal legal system should not be harshly punishing that individual. We should be giving them the help and assistance that they need. We should be allowing them to receive things far under the mandatory minimum and making sure that there are restorative justice programs available to all people um, so that everyone can, can be um, made whole again. Thanks. Thank you. Tahani Abushi. Yeah, I think uh, victims are completely cut out of the decision making process and it's not something that should be in house with the DA's office. I have represented dozens of victims of sexual assault, sexual harassment, domestic violence, um, and I've had to force the hands of police officers to take reports or prosecutors to listen. Often my clients were demeaned and demoralized with questions are you sure you didn't want it, what were you wearing, why weren't you home by that time. Um, and I represent children as young as the third grade who when they uh, you know, merged up the, the courage to tell a teacher or a principal what happened, they were asked if it really happened somewhere else or they were dreaming of it. I think it's important to understand that we need victim services, but not those housed inside the DA's office and contingent upon uh, cooperating with prosecution. We need a victim's advocate that's going to be there between a prosecutor and a victim to make sure we are centering the healing process, not harming. Um, and I think it's extremely important that when we talk about domestic violence, we understand that um, this is complicated. It goes beyond incarceration and prosecution. We need mental health uh, services, financial assistance, housing assistance, childcare assistance. When you break apart a home, even with domestic violence, um, we have to understand that it has reverberating impacts. And you might separate the family with an order of protection and you might destabilize the home for a short period of time. But once that case is up, that, that person is back, both of them are back under the same roof. And what have we done to ensure their safety or to change the ways to ensure a healthy relationship or allow for a person to leave if they want to. That has to be the focus when it comes time to domestic violence, gender-based violence, and our resources that we rely on to respond. Thank you. Liz Crotty? Yeah, I mean, my experience in this, it's 21 years of experience of doing these cases on both sides of the courtroom. These are messy, complicated, very difficult cases with always that are always sad. Um, I've been in, I've been in criminal court. I've been in family court. I've been in the integrative domestic violence part. I understand these cases intrinsically as they've spent a lot of time in my career. That's where my ideas for this bureau comes into. First and foremost, it would be staffed, but we with an ADAs. But one of those ADAs would be a distinctly a legislative ADA who would work on legislation exclusively in this area. The first part of legislation that I would start on is the loophole in the consent law that does not protect women who willingly drank too much, but then get sexually assaulted, where they can't be covered by lack of consent because of how the laws are written. I think this is first and foremost, we have to protect vulnerable people. We have to work on it on a legislative level and we have to look at it in court. This is also to where community investment is the most valuable 
because not everyone trusts the DA's office. And we have to work with community partners and NGOs, and especially women's organizations, where these women's organizations trust the DA's office to help the victims come forward and say, these people are here to help you. The district attorney's office is here to help you. We need to build these bridges. We need for people in communities and impacted communities to trust the DA's office. That is going to help with community ties and community groups who can help the foster those relationships. Thank you. Diana Florence. You know, a survivor centered approach is not new to me and it's not something theoretical. It's something I've done my entire career. I've already talked a couple of about a couple of cases that I've done throughout my career, but I want to go a little bit further in how this would work in my DA's office. Yes, we're going to have a gender based crimes bureau and it is going to center all gender based crimes under one roof. But it's really about talking with the person that is directly and the people that are directly impacted. Sometimes as in my experience, it means a very linear approach, doing the case that's in front of you. Sometimes it's looking for an alternate crime, like a document crime that does not necessitate the survivor to testify. Sometimes it's not criminal at all, but the regardless, it needs to be responsive to the needs of both the survivor and also the accused so that ultimately, especially when there's a prior relationship, uh, that we can actually do justice together. It also means that we need to be calling out the loopholes that exist today that the current DA frankly was an impediment for. And I'm talking about rape is rape. The DA about 10 years ago had an opportunity to change once and for all the penal law to keep up with what we understand. Rape is not simply about vaginal penetration. It is about anyone who's experienced uh, an invasion either anally, orally or other. And we need to be standing up for that and not clinging to these paternalistic old views. Until we really are call rape what it is, we are not gonna be doing justice. I will be that DA. Well, we are now wrapping up our questions. Our final question is going to be a one minute long for each candidate to answer. Uh, and this is very uh, timely. It's been in the news. Um, the next Manhattan DA will inherit the investigation into former President Donald J. Trump's finances, including whether the Trump Organization violated state laws the legality of tax deductions, as well as discrepancies between what the Trump Organization told lenders versus tax authorities about the value of its assets. This is a twofold question, and I know you only have a minute. <laughs> how will you plan to proceed with this specific investigation? And more broadly, how will you ensure that there are substantive consequences for white collar crimes? Lucy Lang, we'll begin with you. In general, I would not deign to speak for the rest of the field, but I know that we all agree that it, it would be a terrible mistake for any of us to make say anything on the campaign trail that would suggest any kind of political motivation with respect to any cases currently pending in front of the office. So what I will tell you is that I am committed to building an investigations division that will continue to fully staff crimes of power, including white collar crimes to ensuring that there are adequate resources to, to commit to ongoing investigations of all magnitudes and to make sure that no matter who someone is, they are held accountable for the crimes that they commit under my administration, whether they were committed during my time in the office or prior to then. As a public defender, I've seen just how rigged our criminal legal system is and how the wealthy and powerful evade accountability and really at the expense of everyone else. And so I think it's absolutely imperative that, you know, this all ties together with the questions you were asking earlier, like my decline to prosecute pro policy will free up resources so that we can investigate those who have always benefited from their own system of justice, like Donald Trump. Um, and for decades now, and certainly for the past um, four years, Americans have watched helplessly as experienced prosecutors and elected officials with all the right credentials try to hold 
Donald Trump and his family accountable and fail over and over and over. Another thing we've seen in the in the last four years is people who are effective at holding the wealthy and powerful accountable come from different backgrounds than people were accustomed to seeing in positions of power. So yes, while it would be irresponsible for me to say with certainty how I would proceed or prosecute a case without seeing the evidence, I will most certainly continue investigations that are on now. And unlike the current DA, if Donald Trump has broken the law, I will prosecute him as well. Okay, thank you, Eliza. And let's, uh, let's continue with Diana Florence. Thanks. You know, I spent two decades prosecuting wholesale corruption in big real estate and construction fraud, and I secured criminal convictions. I have stood up repeatedly to the powerful. I understand from the from the word go that cases don't start the way they end, but I understand how to investigate them and how to try them. And white collar crime and particularly corruption is a cancer in our city. Every time we wait 20 minutes for the train or our schools have 38 kids to a class or our kids are being pe being poisoned in NYCHA. It is because our taxes have been stolen by the powerful. I understand this because I have taken it on. It will be a top priority. Crimes of power, not crimes of poverty has been the centerpiece of my campaign and I will follow the law and the evidence wherever it takes me. It's what I've done my entire career already gone up against Trump when he dropped the Muslim ban. Um, and I co-led the legal team to ensure that we were releasing people from Customs and Border Patrol custody while also suing to have um, that executive order overturned. For me as a civil rights attorney, I keep my eye on the structural issues. And for me, it's focused on changing the system that enabled people like Trump to do what he, he's been accused of. Um, that's why I pledge to never put a bank account or badge above the law. We have to focus on white collar crime because these are the things that have actually jeopardized public safety and brought our country to its knees, whether it was mortgage fraud, wage theft, corruption, um, swiping people's savings, Ponzi schemes. These things happen. They happen not too far from us down on Wall Street. Um, and it's going to take somebody that has uh, no influence or obligation to these powers to be transparent and hold them accountable. Enough to work at the DA's office from 2000 to 2006. And I did spend um, several years in the investigative division in that office, working on a very large scale international case of the oil into the oil for food program established by the UN in investigating Saddam Hussein. I have done international complex white collar cases. This has been a cornerstone of the campaign. When I was at the DA's office, they were Mr. Morgenthau was a case maker. He was a white collar case maker. The list of cases that he established were long and illustrious. I want to bring that back to the district attorney's office. I think that's important. Corporations, hedge funds, banks, they all have our money. They all, they provide jobs and ways of people living and they have to be held accountable and responsible because when they act fraudulently, it affects all New Yorkers. We need to concentrate on investigations, we need to concentrate on white collar cases, and we need to concentrate on making the cases that keep us all financially safe. And I think we, that is the first and foremost of a district attorney's office that I would lead. I've sued the Trump administration in federal court and won. As a federal prosecutor, I've investigated and prosecuted complex tax fraud, financial crimes, public corruption. I don't plan on being outfoxed or intimidated by anybody. And I can tell you that I've spent the last two decades in the law abiding by the principle that none of us is above the law, no matter who we are, what uniform we wear, what office we occupy and what power we have gone on to hold. And I don't intend to stop living by that principle now. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for all uh, all of our candidates for responding the questions. Uh, we will now conclude um, this part of the program with the closing statements. Each candidate will have one minute to give us their closing statement. Um, as part of your closing, we ask that you touch upon the support that you have received so far for your campaign and why you're seeking the Amplify Her endorsement. Tahani Abushi, we'll begin with you. 
Thank you so much. It's imperative that women's voices are not only elevated, but obstacles, um, made up obstacles to us accessing sources of power and running for office are eliminated. Um, and I've watched Amplify Her uh, over many races, elevate voices of not only marginalized candidates, um, but ensure success and support at every way. And so um, I would be humbled to have your endorsement. I'm also proud to be not only a grassroots campaign, but one led by the impacted community. I'm the only one here endorsed by over seven NYCHA resident council presidents, CODA from the Lower East Side, um, many organizations, local and national, including the Real Justice PAC. Um, and it speaks to the fact that we operate on a co-governing model where everything we do is in partnership with community-based leaders, impacted community members, and those who are not former prosecutors, but public defenders, civil rights attorneys, appellate attorneys, and then people from the public health sector. Because in our drive to shrink the footprint of this office, we need to make the Manhattan DA's office a partner in ensuring public safety and public stability by investing resources resources into our families. I hope to earn your support and I appreciate the time to share my vision for the Manhattan DA's office with you. Thank you, Tahani. Uh, we'll continue with Liz Crody. Thank you so much to Amplify Her for having us all here tonight. Women's voices are vital and women's voices need to be heard. That is why I entered this race, because for 21 years, I've been a voice in the courtroom. I've been a voice on both sides of the courtroom. And I think we need to have that voice speaking loudly for all the people who come into this, come into 100 Center Street, both as victims and defendants. I'm proudly endorsed by everyday New Yorkers, by people who go to, go to work every day, take the train, have jobs, and want to see a neighborhood, a, a community that is safe. And that is what I bring to this. And I think that it's the unique voices of all, actually of all of us here tonight, that really makes this a richer race. And I think Amplify Her has done a great job of highlighting the six of us and, and our unique perspectives that we bring to this. But I think I bring the most unique perspective based on my experience and based on what I've done for the past 20 years of providing a voice for people in the courtroom. And that has been amplified by the people who are supporting me. And I look forward to talking further with you guys tonight or tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. And uh, Diana Florence, you're next. Thank you. Thank you so much for hosting this important forum tonight to elevate women's voices. You know, we don't have enough opportunities. And I know that all of us here um, on the forum and panelists alike, that we've all, we've all suffered sexism and misogyny and we've persevered. And I've been really proud throughout 25 years of standing up for everyday New Yorkers, immigrants, tenants, victims and survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. And the, my, my campaign is supported by those very same people. I am so proud that I have 15 labor unions who are supporting me. That means bus drivers and carpenters and laborers and everyday New Yorkers who pick up our trash who do, who do the work that is often invisible. They are supporting me and standing side by side with me. It includes Tara Williams, who was the lead plaintiff in a sexual misconduct case that was brought by the attorney general against a major construction company. I'd be so proud to have your support because I understand that you represent all of us women who have been overlooked for far too long. I pledge as your DA, I will make sure that that will never happen. Thank you, Diana. Uh, let's uh, let's hear from Tally Farhadi and Weinstein. Thank you. You know, as you've seen, there's no shortage of great ideas in this race. Um, the two men also had some ideas not as good as the six women who you've heard from tonight. And there's no shortage of problems that we have identified in the criminal justice system. But what makes me different from all of the other candidates is that I am the only person who has been in the leadership and management of a local district attorney's office making exactly the kind of change that we have talked about tonight. Whether it's standing up for vulnerable women as we did when we sued ICE, to bail, to having an immigration unit, to making prison a last resort, to putting the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act 
into policy. And I think that this is why I have a wide range of support from national experts like Eric Holder, who has endorsed me, to Jackie Rowe Adams, the founder of Harlem Mothers Save, a local activist and hero who has endorsed me, because they know, as New Yorkers know, that we don't have any time to waste. This is really urgent business at an inflection point in our city, and I'm ready to start. I would be so deeply honored to have your support and partnership. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, let's hear from Lucy Lang. Any one of us would be a glass ceiling shattering district attorney. And it matters so much that Amplify Her supports me because I have sat alongside silence breakers in creating my plan for a new sex crimes unit and received their endorsement. I've heard from survivors of Harvey Weinstein about being triggered by being forced to meet with investigators in a hotel room. I've sat alongside trafficking victims who've been triggered by police officers the smell of a cigarette that reminded them of their trafficker. I'm honored to have the endorsement of mothers who lost loved ones to police violence, of progressive prosecutors from across the country, and to have advisory councils to my campaign that include directly impacted New Yorkers, including women from New York State's prisons, and including faith leaders, men and women, who are closest to some of these challenges. I'm committed to a staff that reflects the diversity of our community, including elevating women into senior leadership positions at the district attorney's office, which simply does not reflect the gender parity that we need in leadership. Criminal justice reform is a women's issue, and I hope you'll join me. Thank you, Lucy. And uh, to conclude the closing statements, Eliza Orleans. Thanks, Etta, and thank you everyone from Amplify Her for uh, having us this evening. As I mentioned, I'm the only public defender in this race, and I'm the only one with both the authentic commitment and the experience to transform the system. We all know that changes to our criminal legal system are so long overdue and we don't have time to waste when people's futures and lives are at stake. And so to make that change, we need a Manhattan district attorney who is going to fight for communities of color, for low income people, for women, for families across Manhattan. Um, I'm so proud that the five borough defenders did an analysis of the policies of every candidate running for Manhattan district attorney and found that mine out of every candidate here would be the least harmful for black, brown and low income communities. I'm also so proud to be running the only grassroots campaign for Manhattan district attorney. We, as of the last filing had over 7,300 hundred individual contributions. Um, the only person with a contribution of under $100, let alone under $80 like ours is. And so we have the most grassroots support, more thousands more small dollar donations than anyone else in the race. And that means so much to have the support of everyday New Yorkers. Um, and I hope to earn your support. I would be so honored to receive the endorsement of Amplify Her a wonderful organization that I've been involved in for a long time. Um, and if there are any questions we didn't get to, please feel free to check out my policies at elizaorleans.com and shoot me an email, eliza at elizaorleans.com. And I would be so honored to chat with you and receive your endorsement. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Eliza. And thank you, um, all the candidates. So that wraps up our forum. Thank you so much to all of our candidates. Um, let's give a virtual round of applause to Eliza Orleans, Lucy Lang, Diana Florence, Tally Farhadi and Weinstein, Liz Crody, and Tahani Abushi. It has been such a pleasure of mine to, to be one of the moderators tonight, to hear from all of their, uh, their ideas, their experiences. On behalf of Amplify Her, I'd also like to thank everyone who's tuned in tonight to this candidate forum. We hope that you're not only inspired by these extraordinary women, but will now turn that excitement into action. So speaking of action, this is what you can do. Visit their campaign websites, learn more about the candidates, show your support by making donations. Like Eliza mentioned, small dollar donations make a big difference in these campaigns, so every little bit counts. Even better, volunteer. Grassroots campaigns, uh, which you heard about tonight, operate on a people power, and all of these women can benefit from you sharing your time and talent with the campaigns, and a lot of that can happen even virtually these days. But most importantly, spread the word about the Manhattan District Attorney race and who you believe should be elected the first woman DA in Manhattan. We'll be posting a recording of this forum on our website and encourage you to share it with all of your networks. 
Amplify Her will be voting on our endorsement slate in the coming weeks. To become a voting member of Amplify Her, you need to participate in 10 hours of phone banking or canvassing over the course of a year. So you can go to our website, www.amplifyher.nyc. And this is where you'll find details about upcoming events, announcements, um, and we also encourage you to follow us on social media. Finally, we'd like to hear from you what you thought about tonight's candidate forum and about all the different candidates. We'll be circulating a ranked choice ballot uh, for a straw poll. So you'll be getting that information via email tomorrow. So we encourage you to please vote. Thank you again to our candidates, moderators, my co-moderator, Samantha, audience members, and have a great night, everyone.